everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Today I'm here with uh, bone health expert Laura Pizzarno and the author of Your Bones. And today we're going to be discussing six ways that you can actually accelerate your bone fracture healing process. And so the first thing we're going to actually touch on is protein intake. Oh, protein is critical. Uh, you can't build bone or anything else uh, in your body without protein. And as we get older, we tend to not get enough protein. Uh, you need at least 1.8 uh, grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, um, which for someone my size is about 40 grams of protein a day. But really, a lot of the latest research has shown that a little bit more uh, than that is important, especially um, if you're trying to heal up from a fracture. So for me, it would be more like somewhere between 50 and 60 grams um, of protein a day to support that healing process. And as we age, we tend to eat less protein, uh, in part if you're a woman, um, you're used to cooking for your children who are grown and your husband's uh, old, older like you are, and so you're both eating a little less. Um, so it's really important that what you eat is really good quality food and um, is gonna supply you with all the protein that you need. Uh, one of the concerns about protein is you know, what type of protein should I be eating? Am I getting um, all the amino acids that are essential for uh, building full protein? Um, there are eight essential amino acids. Uh, they're all available in animal proteins, the meats, uh, fish, dairy products. Um, not all of them are present in uh, vegetable proteins like beans, but one of the things that you do when you eat beans, and you'll, you'll notice in traditional cuisines, uh, beans are usually uh, served with either corn, like corn tortillas, or with rice um, in Asian cuisines. And so the missing proteins from the beans are supplied by the carbohydrates that you're consuming with them. And then you're getting all the essential uh, amino acids. Also, you don't have to worry about getting all the essential amino acids at one meal, um, just as long as you're getting them throughout the day, um, you'll be fine. And, uh, it's, it's quite important that you make sure that you're getting adequate protein. So you want to try to have some protein source at every meal. Um, doesn't have to be a meat protein. Um, and in fact, you don't want to consume too much red meat because red meat in particular tends to make the body chemistry more acidic and you want to be more alkaline for your enzymes to function properly um, inside your cells. And so you don't want to overdo it on, on meat. Four ounce serving of meat should be plenty. And I guess that's yeah. what I have to say about protein. No, that's great. I think um, one thing to focus on, especially if you're a vegan or vegetarian, like you said, is the incomplete proteins, and you can definitely like mix and match. So kale with almonds, or like you said, mm -hmm. rice and beans. So I think that's such a great thing um, to highlight there. Mm -hmm. So uh, building off that, I guess the second Sorry. tip for yeah accelerating bone fracture healing process is definitely maintaining your caloric intake. Um, you talked about, you know, as you get older, maybe you're not cooking as much for the kids and maybe you're just eating a bit less. So can you talk to you how important it is to maintain mm -hmm. that calorie intake throughout the day? Sure. Now, unfortunately, in the modern Western developed world, um, consuming enough calories is not often the problem. It's consuming the right kinds of calories. But yes, you, you also want to make sure that you're consuming uh, the right amount of calories for someone your height and weight. And there are many uh, tables and resources that will help you determine what that is. But for most people, it's from uh, 12 to 1,500 calories a day is typically uh, in the range for most of us. Um, but the main thing that you want to focus on is that the calories that you consume are nutrient dense, not nutrient poor. Um, the processed foods, you know, the refined grains with a lot of added sugars um, in the processed foods that we've become addicted to are uh, calorie dense and nutrient poor. And um, I'd like to recommend a really good resource for uh, how to get the best, uh, most nutrient dense foods um, into your diet. And that's, uh, it's a free website called The World's Healthiest Foods. Uh, the website is whfoods.org. And uh, pretty much anything that you wanna know about um, healthy eating and nutrient dense foods is available on that website. And as I mentioned, it is completely free. They don't even accept any kind of advertising from anybody. Uh, the only goal in creating the website was that it be science-based. Um, my husband's medical team, um, including myself, were involved with the creation of this website uh, about 12, 14 years ago now. And I think they now get over a million visitors um, every month. And they, there's lots of 
good recipes uh, that are very quick and easy to do. There's nothing weird or unusual in the ingredient lists, um, and they even have little gifts that help you, you know, learn how to chop an onion if you didn't pick that up on your way through life, um, or pretty much any other cooking technique um, in the recipes. So I highly recommend that, and um, I, when you, especially in, in all your life, but especially when you're trying to heal a fracture, you want to be getting the bi biggest bang for all the calories that you consume, which is um, nutrient density, the most nutrient intake for the fewest calories. Yeah, so I actually use that resource myself sometimes, so it's a really great one. So okay. thanks for sharing that. The third thing that we'd love to focus on in the bone fracture healing process for people would be antioxidants. So you talked about nutrient-dense food. Can you speak to the antioxidants that are in those foods? Sure. Um, I think the, the key antioxidants that we all think about are vitamin C, which is incredibly important for building collagen, um, which is the, the uh, predominant protein in the bone matrix and then vitamin E, which is highly anti-inflammatory um, for those two nutrients. Particularly, let's talk about vitamin E. Uh, vitamin E supplements are not especially helpful because they usually only provide one fraction of vitamin E, which is called alpha tocopherol, and you don't want to only be having alpha tocopherol. It helps you uh, get rid of um, a certain type of free radical, but not all of them, and actually makes your ability to get rid of some of the other ones uh, less. So uh, the primary form of vitamin E in food is called gamma tocopherol, and um, that's hugely abundant, in, particularly in nuts. So if you like nuts, uh, a handful of nuts uh, once or twice a day um, will really help you get your, the vitamin E that you need. Um, for vitamin C, of course, the citrus fruits are the best resource. And if you take supplemental vitamin C, I think a key thing to know is that you don't want to be consuming more than 500 milligrams of vitamin C at a time because that's about the most that your body's going to process at once, so the rest you'll just pee away and you might as well spread it out. Um, also, it's really good to ha eat fruits that are rich in vitamin C, oranges, uh, tangerines, because they have a lot of other phytonutrients in the plant as well. Um, that are very helpful flavonoids that help prevent inflammation and assist our uh, bone rebuilding process in many ways. And um, many, many phytonutrients in plants. I guess the final point I'd like to make about uh, antioxidants and phytonutrients is that they are more abundant in organically grown foods because a lot of these compounds plants produce to protect themselves um, against uh, threats from the environment. And so when plants are organically grown, they're not protected by pesticides and so forth. Um, so you want to choose organically grown produce whenever you can. And also remember that the uh, nutrient content in most plants is towards the outermost part of the plant. There's it's more nutrient dense there because that's the area where the predators are gonna attack the plant. So they focus a lot of their nutrients um, toward the outermost parts of the plant so if it's organic, yeah, you don't have to peel it, right? If it's not organic, you definitely want to peel it because pesticides will be concentrated there as well. Um, and you want to try to eat as much of the outer leaves of the plant as you can. Interesting. I think that's such a good point to highlight. So basically you're saying, you know, if um, an apple or something like that, if it's not um, conventional, so it doesn't have the pesticides and mm -hmm. things like that to protect it, it almost, um, act stronger and um, yes. yeah, just it naturally provide you with itself. much more nutrition. Another thing in terms of apples, uh, if they're conventional, we now think of them as poisoned apples. Okay, If you look at, there's a, another resource I can recommend for you called the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, and every year they come out with a list of the uh, foods that have the most pesticide residues in them. And apples have been one or two on that list, like leading the list with the most pesticide residues. So uh, we, my family now, we don't eat apples unless they're organic. Mm -hmm. Even peeling the skin isn't going to do the job because the, pest, the residues um, are throughout the plant and you can't, you can't avoid them. So I urge you, if you're going to eat apples, please uh, don't eat the poison version, get organic and uh, try to buy local. Yeah, I've noticed that the past two years, apples, like you said, are like one or two, 
Um, and actually, Al Jacal, we have a resource of that, so you can actually um, print the PDF version um, oh, and great. take it to the grocery store and do those uh, dirty dozen, as they call it, mm -hmm. um, and the clean 15. So you can definitely print that, and we'll attach it at the end of this video. Okay, so, great. yeah. Um, I guess the fourth point we'd love to focus on would be, you know, you're going through the fracture healing process. There might be some pain involved, mm -hmm. um, but if you can, maybe limiting the amount of pain meds that you are taking, sure. um, and maybe give us a couple of reasons why that might be a good okay. thing for you. Sure, sure. So, the uh, pain medications, they're called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like um, ibuprofen, you know, Advil, uh, Tylenol, and then of course aspirin. Um, the all of them except for aspirin actually short circuit the resolution of inflammation. So they're analgesic, which means they will help you reduce your pain level, but they're actually going to make it longer for the inflammation to go away that's causing the pain. So if you're experiencing a lot of pain, um, it's really good to relieve that. You don't, you don't want to be in mass pain and miserable and unable to sleep. Sleep is also really important when you're trying to heal. Um, but you don't want to rely on lots of pain medication. Uh, taking a lot of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories increases your risk of uh, bleeding in your intestines. Um, that's one of the one issue that comes up for especially older people when uh, are, they're admitted to the hospital. They'll very very often will find intestinal bleeding from overuse of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It's quite dangerous. Um, so if you have to take some, you want to take aspirin, uh, which doesn't um, interrupt the resolution of inflammation. And the other thing you can do that will really help get rid of inflammation and help you heal up is to consume uh, more fish rich in omega-3s okay, and also um, take a, an omega-3 supplement. The omega-3s, uh, as they go through, I don't know, if you're, hopefully you can attach um, a chart showing the flow, flow chart of how we metabolize yeah. omega-3s. But um, at the end, the end goal of that whole process is the production of these compounds called specialized pro-resolving mediators. And they are produced from both EPA and DHA and they end inflammation, they shut down inflammation. So that's one of the reasons that the omega-3s are so beneficial for us. These uh, compounds, the specialized resolving mediators, there's two groups of them. One are called the resolvents because they resolve inflammation and the other are called the protectants because they protect us against inflammation. So um, increase your intake of omega-3s. Uh, the big kind of highlight throughout this whole thing has been talking about, you know, nutrient density and vitamins and minerals. And so, mm -hmm. um, what do you think about taking, you know, a bone building supplement that provides all those things? Right. That's okay. You really need to ensure that your bones are getting everything that they need to rebuild. I'm assuming I can recommend now to Cal here. <laughs> I use it myself. Um, my family uses it, and I just think it's invaluable. It is the foundational supplement for us. Um, it provides all the key foundational nutrients that our bones absolutely have to have to uh, maintain themselves and certainly have to have when they're trying to repair themselves. So uh, D3, K2, uh, calcium, magnesium, all the trace minerals which are not available really in conventionally grown foods anymore. So what's happened in conventionally grown foods is that we're very grown using ph high phosphate fertilizers. And these compounds, uh, these fertilizers, do not replenish the trace minerals in the soil. In fact, um, they actually are rich in cadmium, which is a very bone destructive uh, heavy metal, toxic heavy metal, and they put that into the soil instead of the trace minerals that we actually need to stay healthy. And so when you are consuming, particularly, I, I would recommend, if you can possibly do so, eat organic and don't get that. Okay. But the conventionally grown foods, it's been over 70 years now of uh, using these high phosphate fertilizers and our soils have just been stripped of the trace minerals that we really, really have to have. Um, I think that's probably a key reason why AlgaCal has been so effective in the medical studies that have been run um, using this supplement in postmenopausal women with uh, bone loss and it's just turned it around because not only are all the basic uh, foundational nutrients for bone health provided, but AlgaCal is an excellent source of all these trace minerals that we're not getting anymore. Um, another issue with not getting the trace minerals from the conventionally grown foods, 
um, and eating the conventionally grown foods and not providing the minerals that we need. So. Can you maybe speak about K2 a bit more because I know uh, a lot of times maybe conventional medicine and conventional doctors talk about you know calcium supplements um, leading to arterial calcification or you know build up in your arteries and why right. K2 is so important if you're right. going to be taking it. So uh, K2 is the uh, vitamin that works as the cofactor, it's like the co-pilot for the enzymes uh, that regulate what happens to calcium um, and other minerals once they get into our system. Okay? So calcium, you want the calcium to go into your bones, there's a, an enzyme that gets activated by vitamin K2, um, and if the vitamin K2 isn't there, obviously this enzyme doesn't work. It's called osteocalcin, and it pulls calcium into your bones. Vitamin K2 also activates another enzyme called matrix GLA protein, which prevents calcium from depositing in your blood vessels, in your arteries, in your heart, also in your kidneys, in your breasts, and in your brain, where you really don't want calcium to go. You have to be able to activate matrix GLA protein to prevent this, and that is the job of vitamin K2. If you're not supplying vitamin K2, these proteins are not going to get activated. And it's really not uh, present in very many foods. Um, you can get some K2 from cheeses. You'd have to eat four to six ounces of cheese a day uh, to get even remotely close to what you need. It still won't be sufficient. The only really, really good source of K2 is a Japanese fermented soybean product called natto, which um, may be an acquired taste for some. I Trust me, I tried. Me too. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it smells like dirty gym socks. It's uh, stringy and gelatinous, and um, it's pretty disgusting for me. Although I do have uh, my husband's brother is married to a wonderful Japanese woman, and they have two children, and they eat natto regularly. Um, they sent it to me. I tried. So you tried. I, yeah. yeah, I take a vitamin K2 supplement. Actually, I take Algecal Plus, mm -hmm. and it gives me the K2 that I need. That's great. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. I guess just wrapping up, we've now covered the five uh, tips to accelerate bone healing, but we do have one more, and that's mm -hmm. obviously physical therapy. So after after you fractured a bone, it's so mm -hmm. important to get that range of motion back in your uh, mm -hmm. joints, and then also mm -hmm. the fracture site, but then also strengthening so it's back mm -hmm. to where it once was. So yeah, yeah. yeah you want to strengthen the muscles uh, that support the bones. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you're getting really good blood flow uh, throughout your body. Remember your bloodstream brings nutrients to all your cells and it carries away the waste from all your cells. So exercise, moving around um, will improve that process and, and speed up your rate of healing. Yeah. Okay, and thank you so much for joining us today. We've discussed the six ways to naturally accelerate your bone healing process. There's more information below this video, but thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.